Thank you. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to the very first in the WAMESA virtual seminar series. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land the Monash University campus is in Melbourne stand, uh, and also the Burukay people who are the traditional owners of the land that I'm doing on fieldwork, um, I'm doing fieldwork on today in New South Wales. So I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Indigenous Australians are the oldest continuous culture and have the oldest Australian earth and environmental science knowledge. So the Wamita seminar series is about showcasing the amazing work of women in earth and environmental science in Australasia. So there are two components to the series. The first is the live seminar series, which you are starting today. Uh, and the other part is recordings from seminars that are hosted by other organisations and available online. So we're collating all of those and putting them up on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, so, and recordings of our live series are going to be there um, as well. So you can uh, have a look at those and feel free to use them in your teaching or just, you know, to learn more about what's going on in Earth Environmental Science in Australia and um, across uh, the yeah, Australasia. Um, so the live series uh, will take place on the first Tuesday of every month, except not in January. So the next, se next seminar will be on February 2. And you can sign up as a member of WAMESA to get notifications um, of the seminars as they um, approach, or you can follow us on Twitter as well. But now, on to our first seminar. So today we have Dr Ailey Gallant from Monash University. So Ailey is a senior lecturer and climate scientist in the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment. Her work seeks to characterise and understand climate variability and change, primarily for the Australia and Southern Hemisphere regions. Her current research has an emphasis on examining the atmospheric processes that cause droughts and the processes that break droughts, including counterintuitively connections between drought and extreme rainfall. So, which that sounds intriguing. Um, so without further delay, we'll move on to Ailey's seminar. So thanks Ailey and over to you. No worries. Thanks Mel. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, and I just also like to pay my respects um, to the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I am right now. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. Um, so today, as Mel said, I'm going to talk a bit about um, some kind of new research that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. It's something I've been thinking about for a while, but I want to kind of present some ideas that are perhaps a bit counterintuitive, but I think a really uh, nice way that we can look at drought in a way that we haven't looked at it before. Because uh, I'm going to show you that there's a lot about drought that we really don't know. So first off, I just want to uh, make a few acknowledgements, just people who've been working with me on this. Uh, first of all, a co-author, uh, Jen Caddo, who's out of the University of Exeter, and uh, my PhD students, well, one PhD student, Mustafa Adamu, and former PhD student, Peter Van Rinch, who did some of this work as well. Okay, so. So first, I just want to set, set the scene a bit with respect to drought. Um, and I want to talk about why this research is so important. So I, I'd like to, some of you might be in rural New South Wales. I think uh, Mel's right in your rural New South Wales at the moment. But thinking about the farmers in, in particularly rural New South Wales and southern Queensland and northern Victoria, kind of in the autumn of 2017, going along, um, you know, minding their own business. And in the winter time, a, a drought really began to bite in the, in the winter of 2017. You know, droughts happen, they figured, okay. But then summer came along and there was no respite from that drought. And then as winter approached the following year in 2018, things really weren't looking that good. Um, so the farmers were preparing for kind of a double barrel drought, 2017 and 2018. Okay, not great. It's happened before though. So, uh, you know, there's things we can do, destock, um, some crops are failing, cut for hay early, things like that. But, you know, might be okay. There's some subsidies from the government. But by 2019, things are getting really dire. Crops are still failing. This is the third year in, the row now, in a row now. Livestock is having to be moved in very large quantities. And as you are all probably very well aware, in, as 2019 drew to a close, um, the parched landscape 
was absolutely ripe for the devastating bushfires that happened in late 2019 and early 2020. And of course, they ripped through very large tracts of land uh, that had been devastated by these three successive years of drought. And basically at that point, all farmers, politicians and the rest of the country really wanted to know was basically why the heck is this drought still going on after three years? It's not just that it's been dry, it's been very dry for three years. And the second thing they wanted to know was when it was going to end. Um, could they expect another year? Was it going to end in a couple of months? At the time, our scientists couldn't tell them. Um, and we still couldn't tell them if there was a drought happening right now. And that's because there's a lot that we still don't know and understand about droughts. And frustratingly, despite the prominence of drought as a, as a phenomenon in this country and the fact that it happens relatively often, we still know very, very little about why droughts persist, um, why they go on for potentially years, and why droughts end. Now, thankfully, in this apocalyptic year that is 2020, thankfully, one good thing happened and the rains returned. So we've had a moderate La Nina this year uh, and the rains have returned in autumn and winter. Um, and the farmers in particular, but the rest of the country as well has breathed, breathed a big sigh of relief. So, that story that I just told you then kind of demonstrates why it's so important that we really improve our understanding of the processes are causing, that are causing Australian droughts. We can look at the drought, we can monitor it as it happens in real time, but it's very difficult to understand exactly why the drought's happening and, you know, do, asking questions like, well, when is it going to end? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So this talk is going to basically outline uh, the fundamentals of Australian drought. That's what I'll start with, uh, just some of the basics. And then I'm gonna talk about why we really don't know about, uh, sorry, we, why we really don't know much about what causes drought. There's been a lot of research about drought over the years and we know a lot, but there's some fundamentals that we really don't know. And then I'm gonna present uh, some evidence to you about um, using perhaps a, a counterintuitive way of, of tackling the drought problem. And that's looking at the flip side of the drought problem, and that's heavy rainfall. And I'll show you why that's important um, and why the, the fact that Australia is a land of droughts and flooding rains is both of them is really important to drought. Okay, so just for some background, for those who don't have uh, a background in, in kind of climate science or, or land atmosphere interactions, drought is uh, one of these really complex problems as a lot of scientific problems are because it's it's a creeping phenomena it's it was described as a creeping in a phenomena way back in 1947 by Tannehill and it's kind of talked about as a wicked problem in climate and has been ever since now this is because drought is usually quite slow to evolve you don't know it's there until you're in it and it's not this nice discrete phenomena like a tropical cyclone or a bushfire or a heat wave where you can kind of say oh yep it's got a nice start it's got a nice end that's it um, it, it occurs over several months and there's really kind of a, a spectrum of drought in the sense that it's not one thing um, so if you i'm not sure if people can see my mouse i hope you can um, but if you think about um, the, how drought happens, all drought is, is fundamentally caused by a lack of rainfall. But from there, uh, we get uh, changes to the land surface and moisture within the land surface, so reduced infiltration, runoff, things like that. But we also get feedbacks to the atmosphere, low relative humidity, uh, clearer conditions, not as much being evaporated from the surface. Uh, and that can then have uh, feedback effects. So where we start with a, an ultimate um, precipitation deficiency, which we tend to call meteorological drought, that can then kind of cascade into this agricultural drought where we think about 
more soil water deficiencies and soil moisture deficiencies that tend to cause plant stress. And then that can cascade again into uh, what we tend to call hydrological drought, where if you, if you get soil water deficiencies and, and lack of rainfall over a long period of time, kind of on the order of years, that starts to really affect uh, stream flow and inflow and lake levels and reservoir levels and, and things like that. And you can have all sorts of impacts associated with this. So drought in that sense is quite complex and it's a real spectrum occurring on uh, lots of different timescales uh, on the order of months right through to the orders of, of years or decades. Now Australia's vulnerability to drought in terms of its, its location is kind of a, a happy accident of a few things and, and the first is to do with its geographical position in the subtropics. So this is just kind of a cross section of what we call the Hadley circulation in the atmosphere. And the Hadley circulation is, you know, if you remember kind of back to, to first year, if you've not done this for a while, um, the Hadley circulation is basically to do with the, the temperature gradient from the equator to the poles, and that encourages a north-south circulation, which is then um, kind of disrupted a bit by the spinning of the earth. And so what tends to happen is that that Hadley circulation um, causes uh, a broad area of high pressure in the subtropics, which happens to be pretty much right where Australia sits. And so throughout the year, the, these, this area in the subtropics is subjected to, um, you know, basically this band of high pressure. The high pressure is, is conducive to, to clear skies and, and um, not much rainfall. Um, and basically, particularly in south, southern Australia and, and eastern Australia, we, we really get this tussle throughout the year between uh, this, this subtropical ridge, we call it, this area of high pressure associated with the descending branch of the Hadley cell and the, the mid-latitude um, environments that are to our south. And those are the things, that, that environment is what brings our, say, fronts and, and uh, mid-latitude cyclones and, and things that, that cause our rainfall. So our geographical position in that sense makes us quite an arid place uh, and that makes us vulnerable to small changes in rainfall that can occur uh, just because of a variability in the climate. So the other factor that influences uh, the Australian environment is what we call large scale modulators of Australian precipitation. So because of that, we tend to have high precipitation variability, which I'll show you in a minute. But we have things like influences from the El Nino Southern Oscillation in the Pacific Ocean. So I'm hoping most of you have heard of, of what we call ENSO. So that's El Nino and La Nina events where you get uh, warming or cooling in the, in the tropical Pacific Ocean. And that leads to this kind of cascading teleconnection in the atmosphere, changes in, a, in circulation over Australia, which can... Uh, influence droughts, right? So there's another there's another one that people talk about in the Indian Ocean called the Indian Ocean Diapole, if you haven't heard of it. Um, but basically, the state of the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, uh, the state of what's going on up in the tropics and, and regionalised sea surface temperatures as well, so temperatures of the oceans in the Coral Sea, temperatures of the oceans in the Eastern Indian Ocean, can all have effect on moisture availability and atmospheric circulation over the Australian continent. But as I'll show you later, we don't exactly know how um, in any great detail, which is a problem. But all of those uh, effects, again, influence the Australian environment. And that really means that Australia has very large precipitation variability compared to a lot of other places around the world, particularly in the southern and eastern part of the country. Um, at comparable latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, Australia has massive precipitation variability compared to other places around the world. And it's that precip precipitation variability that ultimately causes drought. So that's demonstrated here, and I do apologise for the quality of this picture, but I didn't have time to make one myself, and this is the only one I could find that demonstrated what I was showing about. Uh, what I was showing is that really it's, as I said, it's this combination of geographical position, which um, kind of gives us those stochastic influences. And by stochastic influences here, I'm just talking about weather. Um, so we get um, random variations in the weather from year to year. 
And then it's also those remote modulators of climate, that what we call those modes of climate variability, like El Nino, La Nina, the Indian Ocean Dipole, for example, that we call those forced influences because they're, they're forced by sea surface temperature patterns, for example. And all that is what yields this high precipitation variability. And this is shown here. So the top plot here just shows mean annual precipitation. And I kind of want you to concentrate on uh, particularly the east and southeast parts of Australia here. And then the bottom plot uh, here shows what we call the, the coefficient of variation, okay? So the coefficient uh, variation of variation, sorry, is basically just uh, the standard deviation relative to the mean. So how big the vari variability is compared to mean rainfall. And what it, so if you have a, a, a value um, of one, for example, that means that the standard deviation is the same size as the mean. That's a really variable climate. Uh, 0.5 is, is, you know, half the size, et cetera, et cetera. But what you'll notice around the east coast here uh, and eastern Australia here is if you look on the east coast, you can kind of see annual rainfalls up to kind of 600 to 800 millimetres. Now, that's comparable to kind of places in uh, the eastern United States, parts of Europe, for example. Um, it's also comparable to parts of kind of northern China. But if you look at the coefficient of variation in those places compared to the eastern part of Australia, the coefficient of variation for Australia is a lot higher. And so that's indicating that our precipitation variability relative to our mean is actually very large, which is what naturally leads us to be a land of drought and flooding rains. And so this is just demonstrated here. This shows annual rainfall for the Murray-Darling Basin from 1900 uh, until last year. And you can see these massive swings and roundabouts in rainfall. You can see, um, I love this example here in the 50s, and there's another one in the 70s, I think, where you go from uh, near record rainfall, kind of 800 mils a year averaged across the basin to the following year of, you know, less than 400, kind of almost 300 mils a year. That is a huge change from one year to the other. And you get those wild swings because of the reasons I've just outlined. So that's precipitation variability. And as I said, it's precipitation and low precip precipitation that ultimately is the, the catalyst for drought. But the other important aspect of drought is land surface interactions and feedbacks. And so if we've got low precipitation, um, that basically cuts off moisture supply to the surface. Uh, now, meteorological conditions, if we have kind of clear and warm conditions moving in, that can encourage evapotranspiration. But it only encourages evapotranspiration to, to a point because uh, if you look at this, this schematic down the bottom here, basically I've got a, a kind of time series of evapotranspiration in green and what we call potential evapotranspiration in uh, red and then precipitation in kind of the grey, and I'm showing you precipitation being cut off. But if you, have, uh, if you have no precipitation to replenish the soil moisture and you have kind of clear and warm conditions to encourage evapotranspiration, you kind of get to a point though where evapotranspiration will peak and then it will start to drop off considerably, fundamentally because you don't have enough moisture in the soil to um, allow things to evaporate. There's, there's not much to evaporate anymore. So we say we go from an energy limited environment where evapotranspiration is limited by how much um, energy we have to perform that evapotranspiration to a water limited environment where evapotranspiration is limited by the amount of water available. But what we also see is this what we call potential evapotranspiration, which basically indicates the thirst of the atmosphere, how thirsty the atmosphere, how much demand there is for evaporation in the atmosphere will increase as we get into that water limited environment. And because of that, uh, what we tend to have too is a flip in energy partitioning from, from the surface where we kind of had maybe uh, a lot more uh, evaporation in the sense that the, the energy at the surface will preferentially want to evaporate water. Um, but if it can't evaporate water, it basically just turns into heat. And so what you end up with uh, is a very dry lower atmosphere. And this tends to inhibit moisture recycling for precipitation, which feeds back into the atmosphere. So you don't have enough as much moisture available uh, for rainfall in the first place. And it also means that conditions at the surface not only dry out, they heat up, which again feeds back into this hole. Into, into the drought as well. So I've kind of talked about um, precipitation variability and I've talked about those land surface feedbacks and I've talked about 
the influences of those kind of remote drivers and the influences of, um, you know, stochastic weather. So you kind of think, fantastic, great, we know everything we need to know about Australian droughts. It's just all random, you know, what, what does it matter? Well, I may have made it sound like we know a lot, but actually, when it comes to understanding the causes of drought, we actually don't know a whole heap. We know a decent amount, as I've said, about the kind of statistical relationships between these large scale modes of variability. Uh, so El Nino, the um, Indian Ocean Dipole. And we know that uh, those factors play a really strong role in um, Australian drought. And we also know that uh, patterns of sea surface temperatures, for example, can force Australian droughts. We know some things about those mechanisms and we know how um, kind of the nature of rainfall changes during drought. And we know a bit about those land surface interactions and feedbacks as well. But what we know very little about is actually the physical processes that are kind of the immediate causes of drought. So the immediate and the intermediate causes of drought, and then ultimately how they link to the ultimate causes of drought. And I'll explain what I mean by that and why I think we don't know very much. So actually, sorry, I'll show you this. So let, let me, let me, show you what I mean here. So ENSO is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, IOD is the Indian Ocean Dipole. These are these modes of variability. But the argument here is that they can only tell us so much. So every time we get an El Nino, there's actually only a one in three chance that we'll get a drought in Australia. Sounds crazy because we kind of always talk about El Nino being completely synonymous with drought, but it's not. It is a good predictor, but this is shown here, in the, I love this illustration, because these are basically the three strongest El Ninos in the instrumental, uh, in the recent instrumental record, we've got good records. So 1982-83, um, really strong El Nino in the Pacific, terrible drought. Uh, this is the year of um, early, 19, uh, early 1983, we had the, the Ash Wednesday bushfires throughout South Australia and Victoria, um, severe drought across the country, and it was, it was a really bad time. 1997 came along and a very strong El Nino on par with the 1982-83 event was forecast and people started thinking, oh gosh, this is, here we go, here we go. People started preparing and nothing happened. So 1997, you see here, the blue areas basically show above average rainfall here and uh, the white areas show average rainfall and you can just see a few spots of below average rainfall, but nothing like 1982 where you see all these dark reds which show well below average. 2015 again came along uh, and it was another equally strong event. These, if you look in the Pacific Ocean, these three events are actually quite comparable. Um, and 2015 was different again. So we had below average rainfall uh, across most of the east, but it wasn't significantly below average. It wasn't what we would call a severe drought. Uh, and maybe some parts of far southern Australia experienced that, but it wasn't widespread like it was in 1982. So you can see here that the three El Ninos really recorded very different rainfall responses. So why? Well, there's been, well, sorry, when we think about why, was it, was it just that we had random weather events? And so those random weather events were just by chance and they, um, they caused enough rainfall to stave off the drought? Or was that forced? Was it forced by sea surface temperatures el elsewhere or both? Um, so this is some work that uh, my, PhD, my former PhD student, I should say, uh, Peter Van Rensch did, basically showed that it was a bit of both. And people had kind of written off 1997 as just being um, stochastic weather events. So a couple of what we call East Coast lows, a couple of cut off low pressure systems. Um, came through this area and, and dropped uh, a decent amount of rainfall and that staved off the drought. That's fantastic, except they weren't necessarily random. So what Peter showed was that it was actually uh, SS, well, sorry, I shouldn't say SSC, sea surface temperatures off the northeast coast of Australia that encouraged uh, higher rainfall across eastern Australia. So perhaps there was a force component. Um, but linking that force component from the sea surface temperatures to those east coast lows, for example, um, yeah, that's difficult. And it's, it's an interesting question of, of how and whether they were linked. 
So my point here is though, that the statistical relationships between ENSO and IOD, for example, can only tell us so much. Um, and there's a lot more granular and important information going on that we just don't understand. Now, the role of land surface feedbacks in interactions, um, interestingly, a very recent paper by a PhD student, Kiara Holgate out of ANU, showed this, this is a really nice piece of work actually. She basically did some a whole bunch of back trajectory modeling from uh, droughts and non-drought periods um, across the Murray-Darling Basin and showed where the moisture sources were. So basically, um, the reds and the blues here, this is the onset of three drought, uh, yeah, three droughts, uh, the intensification period of three droughts and the termination period of three droughts. And it basically shows the seasonal moisture contribution, uh, the change in the seasonal moisture contribution. So if it's, it's, if it's more red, it's basically um, a much reduced contribution to, um, to precipitation. And if it's blue, it's a, an increased contribution. But what was interesting about her study was that um, in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, precipitation recycling at the surface and contribution of the land surface to the amount of, uh, basically the amount of water that gets into the atmosphere, which then can feed back on the drought, is a really important factor. But not so much in Australia, she showed. So she showed, I think, oh, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it was only about, contributed to about 6% of the change, which is not very much. So that's actually an interesting and recent study um, that's shown that the role of land surface interactions and feedbacks may not be as important as we think, which is actually good from a prediction point of view because that's a lot less, uh, it's a lot harder to predict than say the atmosphere, the atmospheric side of things. But the question remains too, what about persistent drought? And I showed the example of 20, you know, I, I told you the story of, of the 2017 to 2019 drought in southeastern Australia, or eastern Australia, I should say, um, where we basically got winter after winter after winter uh, with no rainfall in much of eastern Australia. But those years weren't necessarily El Nino's, um, and they might have had an Indian Ocean influence in one year, but not necessarily in the other. So why did we get the three years in a row? Was that just random? And why did we get um, no rainfall there in the first place? Again, that granular level information isn't there. So this just shows on the left here, these is, um, this, this plot was done when we didn't know about 2019 yet, it was done in 2019. This just shows kind of the, the double barrel years of drought uh, in Eastern Australia, which is shown by this green box here. Um, and this shows uh, the five worst droughts in that area. And it was really interesting, this, this, these uh, plots here, because when we first saw them, we were quite shocked that the spatial signature in all of the droughts was very similar. So yes, we were concentrating on the East Coast, but what you can see is this real coastal change, um, particularly on the east side of the Great Dividing Range. Um, and you can really see the influence. I mean, in 1976-77, look at the difference here. You see, it's probably a bit hard to see, but right down in Southern Victoria, it was actually wetter than normal, but north of the divide, it was much, much drier than normal. So the interesting thing about that is that can actually tell us a lot about the processes. So again, this is from my student, Peter Van Rinch's work, um, where he basically looked at the relationship between kind of broad scale environmental conditions, atmospheric conditions, I should say not environmental, atmospheric conditions and precipitation variability. And what he showed was basically where you see the colours, um, that's where the, the variable in question is most important for rainfall. So the top one here is for surface pressure. This middle one here is for uh, the, what we call the zonal components of the winds. The zonal just means east-west and uh, the bottom one here shows that it's the meridional component, which basically just means north-south. So what you can see, um, particularly in these kind of southeastern Australian droughts that are, are more coastal in nature, here, here, and here, and here, it's all about the easterlies. And what tends to happen is the predominant winds are easterly here. That tends to pick up moisture off the, off the warm Tasman Sea, bring it in over the Australian continent, hits the Great Dividing Range, up it goes. Uh, and we get what we call orographic effects from precipitation. So what you tend to see in all of these droughts is that the winds flipped to the west. 
and we had persistent westerlies. And so that's what happened 2017 to 19 is we basically just had persistent westerlies for three years. But why that circulation change? And, you know, that granular level understanding just isn't there. So in that sense, um, I think there's a lot that we don't know. We're really good at kind of relating these things down here to these things up here. Hang on a minute. There we go. So we're kind of good at relating statistically these ultimate causes of drought, um, you know, in terms of El Nino Southern Oscillation and IOD, um, and maybe even these intermediate causes of drought, as I've just shown. But we don't know much about this kind of immediate cause. So what caused the change in the westerlies? And what were the particular changes in the weather systems that meant we didn't get rain? Because if we can kind of drill down to those and then link them to this ultimate cause, this really has consequences for the prediction of drought. Because if it's all stochastic, then we can't predict the drought. It's random. Uh, it's just changes in random weather. But if the ultimate causes have links to things like these sea surface temperature patterns, uh, land use, land cover changes, as you said, we'll see, uh, even greenhouse gases and aerosols and those forced components, that re has really big consequences for the prediction of drought because it means that we can say something about drought in the future, that it's not necessarily all random. And the reality is it's probably some combination of the two. But I suppose the, the, my key point here is that I think there's a lot um, in terms of the processes that we still don't know about drought and that really granular level of understanding about the immediate cause of drought in Australia isn't there and it's something that we need to concentrate on and that's what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the talk now. Because I think that there's a way to refocus how we think about and examine drought uh, and that's some stuff that I've been working on recently and will continue to work on over the next couple of years. Um, and there is some evidence that this is a good way to look at drought too from overseas as well. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna build the case for you now as to why we need to, to look, at, look at things in this way. So first let's just set some context um, and let's just think about some really fundamental things. How much does rainfall actually change when we get a drought? So if we just take uh, what we might define as a, a moderate drought, so that's kind of um, a year, for example, where uh, mean, oh, sorry, a year where rainfall is maybe one standard deviation or so below the mean. So that's kind of approximately the lowest 15% of cases or whatever it is, or oh, sorry, this is lowest 10% of cases I've got here. Um, so if we look at that, how big are the rainfall deficits? So you can see in central Australia where there's no <laughs> rainfall, um, that that contribution, uh, drought, you kind of get a really massive reduction, 50, 60, upwards of 70% reduction in annual rainfall is needed to cause what we call a drought. In areas with higher rainfall, uh, you get uh, lower relative changes, but it's, it's, not exa it's not linear in the sense that uh, if you look down on the southern coast of Victoria here, Rainfall here, surprisingly, is actually less than up the east coast here, but it takes less to get a drought. So basically, this just shows that the variability, this is what I showed before, that the variability associated with drought here is a lot higher than it is down here, the interannual variability. So you can kind of see on the east coast uh, and down into the south here, and even in the southwest, across to Perth uh, and southwest WA, broadly speaking, Droughts happen when we get a reduction in rainfall of anywhere from about 30 to 50 percent, right? So the question is, what is the immediate cause of that reduction in rainfall of 30 to 50 percent? And this plot here can start to give us some clues when we think about drought, um, because the other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that that when we talk about drought, we kind of use this catch-all term for drought. We talk about it uh, in terms of kind of seasonal scale drought. So this is 1982-83. This is how bad it was in 1982-83. This is the six months from the 1st of April to uh, the end of February 83. Um, and you can see that the dark red is basically saying it's worst on record for, for most of the east. You can see this is this here is just a time series of what we call the standardised precipitation index. So this just basically takes rainfall and turns it into a Z score. 
Uh, so minus one is one standard deviation, two standard deviation, three standard deviation for what you mean. This is just a time series for this box here, um, kind of in southeastern Australia, it was affected by these three droughts that I'll talk about. But what you can see um, is a whole bunch of months where rainfall was below one standard deviation of the mean. Um, but then you've got the millennium drought, which a lot of us here would have lived through uh, in southeastern Australia. Uh, where you get a lot of those months of below average, uh, sorry, well below average rainfall, below, um, say, my, one standard deviation below the mean. But it's, it's not as simple to say that it's just always dry, because it's not. You can see lots of months here where we have average rainfall, and these light blue dots actually show months where it's above average rainfall. So that's one standard deviation above the mean. So it's not as simple as just saying it's, already, it's always dry. And then this is the most recent drought. So this is that East Australian um, 2017 to 2019 drought. And you can see here, again, we've got a lot of months where rainfall is very, very low, uh, but we've still got a month uh, where it's above average and we've got several months where it's near average. So in this sense, droughts on these timescales are really characteristically different. Um, and um, yeah, my point here though, is that um, if we wanna look at what causes these, so, sorry, in the previous plot, I should have said, these reductions in rainfall, for example, um, you know, that's what equates to, to these uh, changes here. So, you know, this is, if this is about a 30% reduction in rainfall, for example, um, what's actually happening at that granular level? Because we're, as I said, we're not getting periods where it's just dry all the time. And so this is, this is the interesting thing about thinking about drought, uh, droughts, because droughts, when we're talking about particularly longer term droughts, are not persistently dry, but they are persistently not very wet. And what I mean by that is, as I said, there's, there's above average rainfall in some months, there's even, um, you know, moderately above average rainfall. But what's missing are these dark blue dots in every single drought. And these dark blue dots show months of very heavy rainfall. So you can see that's a characteristic of all these periods. And if I was to go further back in time, this is just back to 1980, but if I was to go further back in time, I would show that too. And so what this plot shows is basically um, the number of consecutive months where we can get these red dots. So how many consecutive red dots would we get here in this top left plot? And the answer is usually less than 12, usually more like eight to 10. I think the average is eight. So in other words, we can only get persistently dry conditions or persistently very dry conditions for about eight months at a time. But what we can get, and I mean, this makes sense when you think about it, but what, what is longer and what tends to cause the persistence of droughts is the lack of very wet conditions. So here on the right is basically showing the number of consecutive months where we get, um, where we get con uh, conditions below the light blue dots here. And so you can see all of a sudden this number jumps and we can get, uh, depending on where we are, we kind of can get three to four years where we get uh, the longest period in, in the historical record shows three to four years where we've had a month without um, rainfall above one standard deviation above the mean. So in other words, again, to reiterate, droughts are, are not persistently dry, but they are persistently not very wet. And so I think the, the key takeaway here is that the common characteristic of all droughts, regardless of timescales, is not that they're dry, but that they're not very wet. And this is, this is hopefully you'll see this is where the heavy rainfall or extreme rainfall, um, maybe not flooding rains, but heavy rainfall comes into it. So um, given that droughts are not persistently very wet, let's go back and look at actual droughts and look at kind of rainfall on daily timescales. So now we're looking at weather, right? We're not looking at months of rainfall like we were here. We're looking at days of rainfall. And what we find is that basically rainfall deficits during droughts are almost exclusively 
associated with the absence of heavy rain days. I've got extreme daily rainfall here, but it kind of depends how you define an extreme. I'll say heavy rain days. So what this shows here, let me explain this plot. What this shows here on, whoop, sorry about that. On the left here, basically this shows uh, if we were to split the distribution of daily rainfall up into quartiles, and then this one is for uh, days above the 90th percentile. So this is just rain days. Quartile one, so the bottom, lowest, the, the driest 25%. Um, and when I say driest, these are rain days. So they're not counting days with no rain at all. They're just, so this is the, the lowest 25% of days where there are rain. Uh, the, the second lowest, uh, this is from 50% to 75%. And this is the top 25%. Um, and then this is kind of a subset of this. So this is above the 90th percentile. So basically, um, and then, sorry, on the right here, this shows the, the threshold of actual daily precipitation associ associated with uh, the threshold. So you can kind of see here for the 90th percentile, the dark blues indicate that these are kind of days, those days, particularly up the East Coast, where we get rainfall on the order of kind of 20 millimetres a day. So that's a decent soaking, you know. Uh, the, and quartile four is kind of more like 10 millimetres a day, five to 10 millimetres a day. So these are kind of rain events and, and what we call heavy rain events where we get a decent soaking. Now, this on the left basically shows the difference between normal years and what we're calling drought years, where drought years are defined as the, that lowest 10%. And what we see here is that if you look at the map in quartile one and quartile two, particularly around the east coast and the southeast coast, it's all in the light yellows and in some cases even in the light greens, which basically shows that those light rainfall events change very little. In some cases, they increase slightly during drought. But what you also see is when you get down to these heavy rain days, you see the bright oranges and reds, which basically shows you that the change in rainfall during drought is almost exclusively coming from these heavy rainfall events. So the, the highest precipitation amounts show the, show the large changes. And so these are, yeah, as I said, days of heavy rainfall are halving or more. So what this ultimately means is that it's only a handful of rain days. If we actually look at the numbers, it turns out to be about um, anywhere from one to two weeks worth of rainfall, wherever you're looking. And one week to two weeks worth of rainfall, these, these things aren't independent days. There's often uh, events that last three or four days. And so that means that it's actually only a handful of rain events, maybe two to four rainfall events. And what it means is that only a handful of rainfall events can mean the difference between making and breaking a drought. And that's what's shown here. So on the left here, this shows the number of rain days that we normally get. On the right here shows the number of rain days where the, uh, basically the wettest days, uh, so the number of the wettest days that make up 30% of the annual rainfall and the number of the wettest days that make up half the annual rainfall. So in other words, if you look along the East Coast, less than four days, particularly in central Queensland here, less than four days of rainfall make up 30% of the annual rainfall total. Along the southeast coast, a, week, a week's worth of rainfall makes up 30% of the annual rainfall total. Looking at 50% of the rainfall total, it's more like uh, a week to two weeks worth of rainfall. But if you recall, if I very, very, very briefly go back here, all we needed to get a drought of the order of the ones that I was discussing here, oops, sorry about that, is a rainfall deficit of somewhere between about 30 to 50%. So in other words, all we need to get a drought is for a handful of rainfall events, about a week's worth of rain to disappear, a week's worth of these heavy rainfall events to disappear. And if we look at these heavy rainfall events that actually do disappear, we see that they equate to around changes depending on where you are, but particularly on the southeast coast here, 
it changes, it, it, it's around this 90th percentile here and that fits with what we've already seen. So in other words, it's basically these heavy rainfall events that disappear during drought. Now that's really good news for us because what it means is that instead of looking at drought in terms of the dry side of the spectrum and looking at why it's dry, if we look at why it's not wet, we can isolate drought to ultimately the absence of very specific processes. Oh, sorry, this, so this plot here, I'll just show um, very briefly. This basically shows what I've just shown. So this is what we call, um, and you'll have to excuse the plots here. I, I grabbed them from a, an image that was a global map. <laughs> you couldn't see Australia, so I zoomed in, but they, they have pixelated a little bit because of that. But basically what this shows is this shows during drought changes in the intensity of the wettest five-day event the intensity of the wettest one day rainfall event, uh, the average intensity and then the number of change in the number of wet days. And these are all relative changes so that they're comparable. And what you see is that the changes in these very wet five day events and one day events, in other words, that heavy rainfall, the if you want to call it extreme rainfall, is the stuff that disappears. Uh, you do get a contribution from just the number of rain days that you get in the first place. But this is the stuff that is contributing to the lion's share of the annual rainfall total. And this is, these are the ones that are making the life change. And so the importance of, of extreme wet conditions, I should say, is also relevant to decadal scale droughts as well. So kind of the millennium drought, not just this short, shorter term multi-year drought like the New South Wales Eastern Australian drought of 2017 to 19. Um, this is work by Mustafa Adamu, who, that's just been submitted to Climate Dynamics. And basically he showed that uh, during dry decades, what you see, particularly in southeastern Australia, but what you see worldwide too, is that it's the skewness of the, the rainfall distribution that is causing the change in mean rainfall. Skewness uh, is responsible for the heavy rainfall, for the extreme rainfall. So it's changes in the skewness that is is, is causing the drought. And you can see that this is just for Southeastern Australia, split up into decades. The red one here is the millennium drought from 2001 to 2009. And you can actually see that it's not the dry events that change so much. They're not that different to other decades. But what is different is that this long elongated tail associated with precipitation, sorry, this elongated tail has been pulled right in. So it's the extreme events that have disappeared. Uh, and yeah, I've just kind of said that extreme events that disappeared. So in that sense, if we think about the fact that the extreme events have disappeared, what causes the termination of drought? And that's where we get to the fact that it is, funnily enough, this extreme precipitation. It's these, these you know, from drought to flooding rains. Um, it's the very wet events that return. Uh, and when they return, that's when you get droughts breaking. You can see that in 1982-83, the wetter events here. Uh, and you can't see that in the extension of this time series, um, but it's been quite wet uh, in the last three months uh, of 2020 as well, associated with a moderate La Nina. So the key point here is that rather than assessing the problem or addressing the problem of, of drought as one that's associated with the persistence of, of dry conditions, I think we need to refocus to examine drought as a as an absence of, of these wet conditions because there's limited research that has been done elsewhere, but the, the research that has been done has shown that these very wet conditions can actually be attributed to pretty much one or two different processes. For example, the presence or absence of tropical cyclones or the presence or absence of these things called atmospheric rivers, which are basically just big conveyor belts of, um, big conveyor belts of water in the sky that um, basically bring moisture on shore uh, from the from the subtropics. Um, and so, you know, um, Dedinger, um, Michael Dedinger from the USGS had a look at this in terms of, of Californian droughts or West Coast droughts in general and basically showed that 80 to 90% of US West Coast droughts were broken uh, by a series of atmospheric rivers that occurred, um, you know, over the course of a month or two and basically eroded the drought conditions and we've we've seen that in Australia too but we haven't identified those uh, we haven't identified those processes that actually cause those so by identifying those processes for example cut off lows here 
So instead of concentrating, what I'm saying is that, is that instead of concentrating on statistical relationships between rainfall and these things, we really need to drill down to the fact, well, why don't we get cutoff lows? Why don't we get, you know, this, this kind of weather system here, the cutoff low is responsible for basically all the heavy rain events in Eastern Australia. Whenever you get a heavy rain event, it's always one of these things um, or a tropical cyclone if it's coming from the north which is basically just a tropical cutoff low. So when we're getting um, those events, why, why do we get them or not get them? Why do they form or not form? And if we can answer that question um, and think about the environmental scale conditions um, about why those cutoff lows form, for example, that can tell us a lot about why we get the drought in the first place and uh, can potentially provide some predictability as well. And so that's basically what I just wanted to finish up on here was that instead of examining drought from a range of changes from IOD to ENSO to you know, everything else, that's really important. But by looking at the rain producing systems, we're really just studying, I hope I've shown you that we're really just studying a very small handful of events here, which actually kind of makes it ironically easier. Um, not saying it's easy, still a, a big challenge, but if we can then look at those rain producing systems or non rain producing uh, or the, the lack of them, I should say, that caused the drought and link them back to these ultimate causes um, and to these intermediate causes as well, that has the potential to reveal a lot about, for example, the predictability of drought. So just to finish, um, I'm sure you're all well aware of Dorothea McKellar's poem, My Country. Um, I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains, of ragged mountain ranges, of droughts and flooding rains. Well, I'm not sure that she realised how important flooding rains actually were to droughts as well. So I, I think her, her poem is, is quite, um, well, quite poetic, really. <laughs> and it works quite well for what I'm, I'm looking at. But that's all I have. Um, I hope I've left a little bit of time for questions. Um, questions and feedback is welcome and uh, thanks very much everybody for, for having me here today. I appreciate it. Thanks so much Ailey. That was so um, so interesting. This is not my field so I always learn a lot from your talks. Mm -hmm. So if people want to ask questions you can either type them into the chat and I'll read them out or you can um, show your you could um, show your turn your camera on and turn your microphone on and then um, just yell out and that's another way. So I, I think while people are thinking um, of their questions. I just have a quick one that I'll sneak in. So I was wondering, um, so these are heavy, heavy rain days. Do, what, what effect is climate change having on those? Are they becoming less, uh, less frequent or what, do you know anything about that? Yeah, well, that's a really good question actually, Mel, because that's, I mean, that's ultimately, you know, if, if we can say that drought is from the absence of these events and we, we can exactly use questions like that to, to, guide what we think might happen to drought with climate change, um, which is, it's a very different perspective, I think, that people haven't looked at before, but I think one that could be quite revealing. Um, now, in that sense, uh, there has been, kind of depends where you are. Uh, in the southeast, there's been a bit of a reduction in those um, extreme rainfall events. Um, but in the north of Australia, there's been a bit of an increase. It tends to be that when you get those events, uh, they have more rainfall associated with them than they once did, and that's what's expected with climate change and what's expected to continue into the future. Um, but, you know, how much influence that would have on a drought, whether you're getting them or not, it's a question that we don't know yet and something that we really need to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It sounds like lots of research still to be done. Um, yeah. Um, did anyone else have a question? If not, then I have another one. <laughs> I always think about when um, I yeah, hear about your research, I always think about the uh, farmers and because I just think it must be so stressful to be a farmer in the east, in Eastern Australia. Um, do you know, like, especially because, you know, just basically hanging out for what was it, like four days of heavy rain? Like that just seems like such a sporadic, um, sporadic event. Do you know, are they, are far, I don't know if you know anything about how farmers um, adjust to these sorts of, um, this sort of, unpredictability but are they just super adaptable or what, yeah what look I, to be honest I, I I don't know specifically but I, I should say look it's not that they you know farming in these they get more than four days of rain 
Um, but what I, I suppose the argument I'm making is that that, that you know, week's worth of rain means the difference between drought and not. Um, and I think the other thing that we need to think about for farmers is that, you know, how the rain falls is really important for them. Um, so to get those soaking rains is really important. Um, so in, in, in that sense, I don't think the amount, it's, it's not necessarily a linear thing that the amount of rainfall is uh, related to how well or not they do um, in terms of productivity. Because, you know, if the rainfall all falls in one month uh, and it's the wrong month for growing or, you know, germination or whatever, if you're talking crops, um, that's a problem. So how the rain falls um, and, you know, if you're talking about climate change, potentially how that changes is a really really um, big thing for farmers and something that, yeah, they'll, they'll need to be even more adaptable with, depending on what happens. So yeah, the, the farmers, the farmers do cop it. Um, it's, it's a, it's a hard industry to be in, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they must be so resilient. Yeah, well, in that sense, I think it's, you know, when it works, it works spectacularly and the yields are massive. Um, but yeah, it can also fail spectacularly as well, which is just a product product of Australia's precipitation variability. It's it's not consistent, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been I've I always um, well, I've been reading your um, column in the Leader newspaper about you know the rainfall in my area. Although I moved and I don't get the newspaper anymore, but I really love um, reading those um, those columns. Do you get much feedback from the general public about? you know, the information you provide about climate change and rainfall and weather and that? Yeah, no, I do actually. We actually had, um, surprisingly, <laughs> um, we've had great feedback um, from everybody. I've only ever had positive feedback, which is great. But I should say that those, uh, those newspapers won't exist anymore because News Corp decided not to publish them anymore. But uh, those columns are coming back online. So you'll see them online soon. Um, oh, I do have a question though, Mel. Can I from Amber, can I? Oh um, yes, great. Yeah, go yeah. for it. So, so Amber's asked, does intense rain affect the soil quality? Are you looking to work with Vanessa Wong in soil condition potentially? I don't know, Ness, do you want to work together? <laughs> <laughs> the short answer to your question, Amber, is, is I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I imagine that, I'm guessing here, Vanessa could probably answer that. <laughs> Thanks, Ness. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that rain, could affect soil quality in the sense that how rapidly it strips out nutrients and things like that. But um, yeah, I, it's a really good question. Um, and one that I, I'm not sure that I can answer, but yeah, Vanessa might be able to let you know about soil quality and rainfall. To be honest, I think it's, it's more in terms of what I was just talking about. It's more, um, you know, it's more about how much moisture the soil can retain in the sense that if, if it all falls in two hours with an intense thunderstorm, which is not necessarily what I'm talking about here, but if it all falls in two hours, um, you know, you can get a lot of runoff and after drought, the soil can be quite hydrophobic as well. Um, and so that's not overly useful if you kind of need persistent rainfall. I mean, think about your veggie garden at home. If you, if you kind of watered it all, if you watered it once a week and watered it with enough rainfall or, you know, watered it with a certain amount of rainfall once a week as opposed to splitting that up over watering it every day, then um, it's going to make a big difference to your plants because the, the moisture will, will um, drain away and it, it will evaporate. And, and so watering it once a week is, is not going to keep your veggies alive. Uh, here we go. Vanessa says the most obvious effect will be increased erosion when you lose the topsoil, which is where most of the nutrients and organic matter are held. So there you go. So intense rain does affect soil quality. Thanks, Vanessa. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, that's great. Okay. So if there are no other further questions, then I might um, bring us to an end because we're almost at three o'clock. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much, Ailey, for that wonderful talk. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, and yeah, for giving the first uh, WAMESA virtual seminar. So I hope that everyone can join us again in February for the next instalment. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's it for today. Well, thanks. thanks. Well, thanks everybody for coming.